All guests on Zaslow Show 2.0 brought to us by the official beer of the program, Johnny Cuba. European roots with that Caribbean soul, a refreshing German lager in a can. If you're getting ready for the tournament, you want to make sure you pick up a six-pack of Johnny Cuba, your local Sedanos, Presidente, Win dixie Fresco y Mas. Make sure you always drink responsibly. And, of course, don't forget Johnny Cuba's mantra, stay tranquilo. Joining us now is my favorite co-host. You hear her every night on ESPN Radio, 7 to 10 p.m. weeknight. That includes tonight, Amber and Ian. Amber Wilson joining us here. Hello, Amber. How are you? Good to see you. Hello, Zazlo. Thanks for having me. I felt I had to have you on the show today, the timing, because, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing at least one show a week together every week for a good run now, for a while now, but we don't have any shows together this week. So I figured something doesn't feel right. Let's just have you on my show and we'll keep this run going. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> so with the tournament today, let's start out with some fun. First thing, when you, when you think back of the tournament, what is your what is your first memory of wow this this shit's really cool like the, the tournament oh my god I really like this do you have a a memory of the first time you noticed how much fun the tournament was oh god not the first time it's funny these first time memories for sports people always ask me these first time memories and I just I feel like for me March Madness has just been built in for so long that I couldn't tell you one I mean for me the most poignant memories are the ones where the Gators win the national championship. So those are the most poignant memories back to back last team, by the way, ever to go back to back still uh, to this day. We'll see if UConn can do it uh, all these years later, but those are the most poignant memories, but I was already an adult for those memories. I mean, I was on the floor when we won the national championship in Indianapolis because I was working at the time at the station in Gainesville uh, covering that team that entire year. So that was in 2000. How did you stay professional? I mean, I, I was not incredibly professional, but I was somewhat because the thing was too, I was young. Like, I actually think I'd be less professional now in my forties than I was in my early twenties, but I was young and I was trying to get a real job in the business because I was interning full time at, w, at WCB, at JB, right? TV 20 in Gainesville. And uh, I was just starting out. So I'm trying to put together a resume reel. I'm doing anything I can. Um, I'm logging every game, which is a t incredibly tedious task. So I'm logging everything that happens in every college basketball Gators game that entire season. I was at every single game. Um, on the court, logging all the games so that we would know when we used highlights or tapes or whatever. I mean, this is like old school stuff when not everything was just like instantly available to you. Uh, but so we would know, we would know where we were at in the game, everything that we wanted to gather, that sort of thing. So it was, it was a tedious job and I, but I was really, really hungry. And that made me professional because I knew I had to display a semblance of professionalism. Now, at this point, like I'm I'm on the mothership. I'm at ESPN. I made it to a certain extent. I'm pretty sure professionalism for me now might go out the window because I wouldn't feel as endangered by it. But yeah, that was the only way that I maintained my cool is because I was so hungry and so desperate at the time to get a real job and, and to look good to all the media members who were there covering the same event. So do you do you have a like from the 90s when you were a kid? Because I always go back to like the first time that I noticed that the tournament is a really cool thing, it was early 90s, 1991, you know, Duke finally topping UNLV, those stacked UNLV teams that were coming off a national championship. So I was 10 years old, so you were a couple years yeah, younger cool. than me yeah. at that point. And, and, you know, it was Christian Leitner. Uh, right. But then, of course, also you go a couple years after that, and now we're talking about the Fab Five and Michigan, which I'm sure got a lot of people's attention. Them, I remember some. I, the Leitner team, I don't know if I really remember watching that team or if I remember it now from, from all the years since and the yeah. knowledge of that team and the knowledge of Christian Leitner. You know what I mean? Like, that mm -hmm. happens to me with sports. I don't know if that happens. You're not sure if you else. actually saw it or if yeah. you just see so many highlights. I'm like, what? team or is it just it's such an iconic team and, and Christian Leitner in particular like this iconic player in, in the history of college basketball that now somebody who's been in sports her whole life I'm thinking okay did I really witness the greatness or did I do I remember the greatness because of the story of the greatness that I've witnessed since and so it's hard for me to determine the Michigan team I remember or at least like 
pretty positive. I remember that team. That team I remember. Um, but 91, that's going that's going back pretty far. Do you, when you think about your favorite, like, Cinderella stories, do you have a favorite? George Mason. I think that's, like, the first Cinderella story. I mean, not, you know, I wasn't young, but I feel like George Mason was the Cinderella story that I remember being in the most invested in. Uh, so, I mean, that's really the one that probably comes to to my mind the fastest. And then the Gators ended it. And the Gators ended it. And that's also why. <laughs> Yeah, and the Gators ended it. Uh, what's your What's your setup today? Uh, oh, obviously, you're, obviously, you're on tonight, seven o'clock. What's your setup today for the tournament? Like, do you get the multiple TVs going on? I do have a man cave in my house. Um, I've got an obscene amount of televisions in the man cave, so I could have every game on in my television man cave if I wanted to, which is really really cool. Which is what uh, football season looks like in my house on Saturdays and Sundays. And so now we're back to another time of year where I have a reason to have a bunch of stuff on a bunch of different televisions in my house. So yes, I will probably be firing up the man cave today. Do you feel any pressure to perform in the ESPN radio bracket challenge? No, I feel none. Um, I've made a a bunch of brackets at this point. I, I don't even remember who I picked in the bracket challenge. I think in the bracket challenge, I have UConn winning it all. Um, I like to hedge, you know, you fill out multiple brackets, you've got a better shot at being right about something. Uh, and some of them I pull, I chose some crazy upsets. I was disappointed that I couldn't choose the Gators to really be one of those teams with the upsets this season, because obviously, uh, a devastating loss there in the SEC championship, but I did choose some crazy upsets. I tried to keep it a little bit more conservative in our actual ESPN radio bracket challenge. But no, I don't feel any pressure. That stuff is such a crapshoot. It's not like if I won the bracket challenge for CBS Sports when I first started working there. That was the very beginning of my career. That was back in 2007. And I won it that year. But that's because I was being a homer and I picked the Gators to win the national championship. And of course, nobody else did. And the Gators won the national championship. So I ended up winning like a lot of money. And I won the whole company thing because it was like a company pool where everybody went into it that that worked there. So that was really, really cool. But lightning doesn't strike twice when it comes to brackets. So I've already done that in my life. I've already won the whole thing. It's not going to happen again. <laughs> I saw there's close to like $3 billion they're expecting to be wagered on the NCAA tournament over the next few weeks. But that brings me to, you got over the last couple days, you have like a congruence of gambling stories across two sports that feel like one of them certainly feels like it may be kind of a big deal. And that's the Otani stuff. Like, do you see what's going on? So, so show you Otani's, uh, I guess, long time in turn, or he's been with the with that, with him for three years. They're like best friends and he was fired yesterday. And there's been a lot of language that's been, I guess, changed that now they're calling it theft. Mm-hmm. is the reason that that the interpreter has been fired and it seems like it might be tied to gambling and it certainly is not beyond the realm of possibility where is it possible that Otani either knew or was involved in this in a major way like this is a potential massive story for major league baseball massive it looks like over 4 million dollars of Otani's money got paid out to a sports book, right? And I mean, there's not really very good ways to explain that. So how do you explain that? Oh, my buddy stole $4 million from me because he had a gambling problem and he went ahead and did this. I have no idea if that's true or not. The reports are that they were very, very close. Obviously his interpreter has been around him. I mean, it's been very public. We've seen him a million times around Otani. So this person was the confidant of Shohei Otani. However... Does that mean that he's got access to your bank account? I don't know how it works when you're worth, you know, $700 million. I've never been worth that, Zazlo. So would I give access to my best friend to, you know, $20 million here and there? I don't know. I, I, I would cross that bridge when I got to it. It seems outlandish to the rest of us, right? I mean, it sounds a little strange, a little bizarre that your friend, your friend, not your financial advisor, Not your fiduciary in any way, like your friend, not your lawyer, not your manager, your friend, not your Mm -hmm. agent. He would have access to transfer 
transfer not just $4 or $40 or $400, but $4 million. And I don't care how much you're worth. $4 million, you wouldn't notice. Also, you're not signing off on it. Also, there's no checks and balances. Also, your financial institution's not like, hmm, did Shohei approve this? Right? Like, I mean, it seems really odd. Like, does he have power of attorney over Shohei Otani's? So then there's this other story that where he had said, and I believe in an interview to ESPN where the interpreter himself had said like he had this gambling debt and Shohei was kind enough to pay it off for him. So like that seems like the original story was going to be, oh, show my friend is helping me get out of trouble by paying off my gambling debt. Not that he's gambling. He's, he's got no knowledge of it. He's got nothing to do with gambling, but like I got myself in hot water, which, you know, that, Okay. And, you know, and I, this has nothing to do with him, but he's kind enough because we're really good friends. He's like, sure, here's 4 million. And that's why it came from his account. So there was that story. Then it seems like that story has now changed to, oh, this dude stole from Otani because it's a massive problem that the funds Mm -hmm. go from what appears allegedly to go from Otani's account to gambling. Like that, Mm -hmm. that link right there, massive situation. So how do we explain that away? I feel like now the, you know, lawyers around Shohei have gotten involved and his managers and his agents. And they're like, no, 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 this is what we do. Okay. This dude stole the money from me. I don't know. I mean, again, all allegedly I'm, I'm being reckless speculation because it seems really strange, the story. And certainly athletes get taken advantage of by people all the time. I see it in my law practice all the time. We represent dozens and dozens and dozens of athletes mostly NFL players, but some high profile NBA players as well. And I can't tell you how many people in their lives take money from them or try to take money from them or scam them out of money. I mean, it is grotesque when people know you have tons of money, people are going to come after your money. So that part's not outlandish that maybe somebody, even, even a best friend could rob Shohei. I mean, certainly wouldn't be the first best friend who has robbed a rich, famous person before by any means, but just the we the way that it was done seems a bit odd. And Pete Rose is is banned for life from baseball, uh, Mm -hmm. which is stupid, but banned for life from baseball for betting. And now we live in a betting world where the actual face of baseball, the most important player, the best player that we have seen since Babe Ruth might be involved in a really serious betting scandal. If you're Major League Baseball, you're going to do everything you can to try to cover this up or sweep this under the rug or make it, but the problem is the feds are now involved as well. And there's a federal investigation. And I just wonder, like, what's the power of the, if are we in a world where we might find out that Shohei Otani himself was actually betting millions of dollars on sports? I mean, that would be a massive problem for MLB. Massive. And, and you see also uh, J.B. Bickerstaff, you know, the heat last night, the heat beat the Cavaliers, but before the game started, Cavaliers head coach J.B. Bickerstaff talked about how he he re, he reported to the NBA that he and his family have recently received uh, threats, death threats, physical harm based on gambling. Now it's just it's so easy for fans these days, players because of social media. Uh, and look, you could find phone numbers, you can call people's houses. It, it, it's so easy for fans now to access players and or coaches, but also it's so easy for everybody to gamble. And now it's not just fans getting angry that you cost their favorite team the game. It's fans getting angry that you cost them money. And in Cleveland, they have a sports book in the arena, I believe. Like there's a sports book right there in the arena. You could do live in-game betting. And I, I, I feel like it's being made out to be that it's, a problem that the NBA and the other major sports are in bed with these gambling companies. But that's like, even if the NBA weren't in bed with whatever gambling companies they're with, it's, you know, the states are the ones who have passed these laws where you are legally allowed to gamble. So whether the pro sports league is involved or in bed with these gambling sites or not, it, like it's still going to be readily available to all of these people. Right. The only problem with sports leagues being involved, the only problem that that potentially obviously arises is the integrity of the game conversation. And that's, that's the only problem there, that that's a more difficult situation for these leagues 
to navigate when they are now partners with all of these, you know, gambling books and gambling sites and different different things that are now coming to fruition. The reality is you could also make an argument on the other side that in, fr- in terms of integrity of the game, now everything's above board. And both these sports books and these sports leagues have a vested interest in trying to make sure that there is, in fact, integrity of the game because it helps everybody out in terms of them making money, right? You don't want to lose money because all of a sudden everybody thinks games are fixed and then people stop betting on games, right? So even the sports books don't want anything to do with that. So they're kind of all in accord in terms of that goal. But there's obvious integrity of the game, uh, at least from an optics standpoint, problems that could arise there. I don't, I agree with you. I don't think that it's perpetuating the problem, generally speaking, of gambling, because that is going to be a state law issue and that's available to people regardless. And frankly, I think it should be. Now, are there going to be crazy people? Like Bickerstaff said, you know, some people are, it's their rent money, right? It's their it's their food money. It's their, it's their livelihood that they are gambling on these games. And so then they become desperate when they don't get the results that they need because of something that you did or something that a player did or a team did or an organization did. And can that cause people to go more crazy? And and so obviously that problem to me is a crazy people problem, right? Like that problem to me is people not being responsible themselves because the reality is that you have to be responsible with the way that you're betting. And I do think that the majority of us are, and I do think that the majority of us have the ability to be responsible and to have fun with it and to bet money that we can lose because that's what you should always be doing with betting. But we know that's not always the case with everybody. I, I'm not one who subscribes to the theory that a, a few bad apples should ruin it for everybody else because I don't think that's the overwhelming majority of people. But the reality is it's it's obviously a, an extra scary proposition for athletes and coaches and everybody involved in these organizations. But these things exist anyways. The crazy people exist anyways. I mean, I had somebody wish death on my son when you and I had a local show in Miami because I said something negative about the Miami Hurricanes. And all you and I did for years was talk about the Canes. And I was actually very kind to the Canes, even though I'm a Gators fan. But I was critical of the Canes, at, you know, for a game or whatever. I don't even remember the the specific. I don't remember spot. either. I don't remember. But what I do remember is this dude, I had just had a baby and this dude wished SIDS on my baby son. And it wasn't because he was gambling on my games. And it turned out he was a, a lawyer in Georgia and he was had a wife and kids of himself and all this stuff. Of course, the internet went after him after he did that and uncovered all these things about him. But he didn't have money on what I was saying. And yet he was still that upset and emotional. So that can happen with sports fans generally. And it's crazy people and it's bad people. And and certainly none of that should happen. And, and there's no reason in the world of sports to ever be issuing death threats on anybody. Or, or probably just generally speaking, like just kind of in life, I've never really gone the death. You own that statement? Nobody should be. Statement. You own that statement. I own it. Okay. All right. Nobody that's yours. should be issuing death threats on anybody when it comes to sports. All right. That's yours. How about <laughs> last night, Amber Wilson? How about the Heat? Te- How much better is Terry Rozier than Kyle Lowry? I mean, come on. What are we doing here? Oh, it's funny because there's people that hate Terry Rozier the same way that they hated Kyle Lowry. Like, I don't think Scary Terry is much more popular amongst some Heat fans. Really? Than Kyle Lowry was. Mike Ryan. I always hear Mike Ryan going off about Oh, Terry Mike Rozier Ryan is him. not the representation anymore. Oh, like my he, goodness. He's been so anti-Heat for several years now. He is not the representative. Well, he's a particularly anti-Tyler Hero and particularly anti-Scary Terry. Uh yeah, I mean, you hate Kyle Lowry. So I, I honestly think Terry Rozier, if he was just like existing on a basketball court, you would say he was better That's right. than Kyle Lowry. I didn't hate That's Kyle Lowry as much as you do. I'm not in love with Terry. Like, he's fine. It's fine. I, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated with the Heat generally at this point a little bit because I do think that they've sucked the fun out of the regular season some. As a Heat fan... It, it's kind of a bummer. And yes, would I rather my team be good in the postseason and actually get stuff done in the postseason than win the regular season? Like, yes, you know, I'd, I'd rather be actually, you know, I'd rather have actual championships here in the last couple decades instead of like always winning the regular season like the Boston Celtics. So there's a little C shot for you. But at the same time, Celtics fans have a lot more to watch during the regular season than we do as Heat fans because nobody gives a shit on the Heat, it feels like, about the regular season. That's the reality of the situation. So You know, it it is what it is. What do we have on tap tonight? Are we doing wall-to-wall NCAA tournament coverage? I'm doing game night tonight. I think that's what we're doing, uh, wall-to-wall NCAA tournament. 
I don't know. I, I probably not wall to wall. I feel like we never do wall to wall when it comes to college basketball. We did have a college basketball round table special on Tuesday night where yes, we had a built in hour that was just college basketball. We had a bunch of guests. You can always check out the podcast in the ESPN app to find Amber and Ian, Amber and Ian. Um, but, um, I would imagine we'll mix in some NFL and, and some others. And we always end up football's king. And you always end up talking a little football, even, even during March madness, but yes, it'll be a lot, a lot of tournament tonight. So you can hear Amber tonight, 7 to 10 p.m. ESPN Radio, Amber and Ian. I will follow her doing game night from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. I got to mix in a nap somewhere here. I got to find some pocket during the tournament here <laughs> to get in a nap so I could do the show tonight. Yeah. Well, it's a late show. You're on until 1 in the morning, and you have to be on on until 1 in the morning. That's always the difficult part of of what we do for a living that people don't realize. I mean, even when you and I were on the morning show, it was like we would have to go in – and it's not like you just have to get to work and be like working at 5.30 in the morning. I mean, that's one thing if you're working a desk job. It's another thing if you do what we did, where it's like you have to be like awake and like, hello, America, at 5.30 in the morning. It's the yeah, but you would, you, would nice roll in at, you would roll in at 5.28. Okay, I was always there. Door. I was always there at the start of the show. That's all that matters. Amber, great job. Thanks for hanging out today. Everyone will be listening to you tonight. No pressure. <laughs> Thanks for having me.